someone wrote in with the question, what's left after enlightenment? What's the point? The best way to deal with this question is to look at the question itself. Actually, it's two questions. What's left after enlightenment and what's the point of the whole thing? Let's analyze the questions themselves because they <clears throat> contain certain uh, presuppositions. And looking at those presuppositions will be helpful in answering the questions. If you say what's left after enlightenment, the implication of that language is that there is a single moment of enlightenment and that basically enlightenment is this binary system. You're not enlightened, then you are enlightened, and it's these two things. However, it has been my experience that it's not at all like that. Um, that although some people have a dramatic moment of enlightenment, it does happen. Uh, for most people, it sort of sneaks up on them. And unless it's pointed out to them, they might not even be aware of quite how enlightened they've become. Because they've acclimatized to it. So enlightenment experience does not necessarily involve one or a sequence of dramatic, sudden experiences. It may, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes it's a more gradual process. In fact, usually it's a more gradual process. If you look at nature, you'll see that some processes in nature are discontinuous. They jump. Some processes in nature are continuous. And... Um, took mathematicians quite a long time to develop a, an advanced form of calculus that could simultaneously deal with both continuous and discontinuous functions. But they had to because it, the nature of nature is that way. And since enlightenment is part of nature, it's a natural process. It's even called seeing your nature, can show, to see your nature. So because it's part of nature, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, there are both sudden and gradual uh, components to the endeavor. So if you say what's left after enlightenment, it implies that there's this single sudden thing that somebody goes through, and there's a before and an after. Even if one had one of the uh, sudden types of experiences, uh, there's still a lifetime of working out the consequences of that, uh, improving behaviors, working through negative patterns. In my own case, uh, I did have a sudden experience. That is true, as the result of systematic cultivation. Some people have sudden experiences without even having practiced. That's quite extraordinary, but it does happen. Just out of nowhere, suddenly, they see what in Buddhism we call the no-self. It happened to me uh, a rather long time ago. I'm 65 now, and uh, it was a while back. But I've had to spend my entire life refining the implications of that, realizing how screwed up I was in so many areas, even after that experience. It wasn't all that many years ago that I saw a psychotherapist. Hey, a psychiatrist, an MD, for 18 months to work on some behavioral issues that I felt I needed something besides the meditation practice. So, one shouldn't think uh, that there's like a, there's like enlightenment and then there's <laughs> this after enlightenment thing. Uh, it can be more gradual for one thing, and even if it's sudden, um, you got a, a long, long way to go uh, after you've seen the no-self. Uh, you've got to, that's just seeing the ox, okay? Look at the ox thirty pictures, you've got to get on that ox. <laughs> got to ride that ox in daily life. So part of the problem is the formulation of the question, implying there's like, you know, enlightenment and then there's after enlightenment. There's enlightenment and then there's a lifetime of after enlightenment, if, if it's a sudden one. So it's still a lifetime. Now we can, having 
clear that away, we can talk about, well, what's left, if you want to say what's left. Uh, well, what's left is a whole bunch of screw-ups and bad habits and the effortless flow of emptiness. And as time goes on, the effortless flow of emptiness more and more eats up um, the screw-ups and the bad habits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So as time goes on, more and more of what's left is uh, the effortless flow of emptiness, which doesn't sound all that appealing until you actually experience it. And then it's like, well, if you had a choice of living one day that way or living your whole life not that way, you'd say, well, I'll take the one day and you could kill me at the end of the day. That's how good the effortless flow of emptiness is. More and more of what's left is less and less something and more and more doing. What's the point? Well, that also sort of goes to an issue of meaning. It's asking what's the meaning? What's the ultimate meaning? What's the meaning of the path? What's the purpose of the path? But the funny thing is, is that you have to work through the need to have meaning. And I've given some talks about that. So that, in a sense, the answer to that question, what does it all mean or what is the purpose, uh, once again, you have to look at the question and realize that there's an implication there. As you begin to work through the need uh, to find the purpose, the purpose arises spontaneously. Now, could I put a word to the point? If you asked, what's the point? Could I put a word to that point? Where the ox takes you would sort of be maybe the point of the thing. So, yes, I can put a word to that point. That word would be love. That's the 